Hi, my name is Tony McLaughlin. I'm the literacy consultant for the Callaghan series of schools, Walls End, Waratah and Jesmond. I've been a head teacher of English for some time and an HSE marker. And what we're aiming to do today, um, in my own nasal, cold infested face, is talk about the area of study and the tempest and how those two link together. I've got several aims for this podcast. And excuse me, I'm going to be reading every now and then, so I apologise for my head going down. But I'll try and actually, I'm talking to you. You're the advanced English students of Jesmond Senior College. Strong English students. So if my head goes down, I'm actually still looking at you in my own way. So the aim of this vodcast is several fold. To broaden your understanding of the area of study. To link the area of study discovery to the set text The Tempest. To establish a way into writing about the area of study that focuses on developing your own voice in the writing. And that's really vital. An HSC marker is going to be marking 25, 30, looking at 25, 30,000 scripts. What makes yours stand out is that it's your voice. So don't worry about whether your voice is the right voice. As long as it's yours, you'll believe what you're saying, it'll be fine. Four, to provide some activities that scaffold thinking about the text and allow some interaction with the area of study in the text. Now this will be frustrating as we go through this because I'll be stopping the video and asking you to do some exercises either with your class or you can do them by yourself as a review or revision. But so every now and then I'm going to ask, okay, stop, try this exercise. Might get frustrating, bear with it. It, it there is a purpose to it. And the last, to engage in the area of study that shows that the horizon is achievable and success is achievable. So, two things I need to say before we get stuck in. There are stacks of resources, stacks of notes and suggestions on the net on the Tempest in the area of study discovery. It's fine to look at some of this stuff, but remember it's your views that are needed. And it's the fact they are honest, personal and yours that make your understandings of the area of study real. So look at all those other bits and pieces by all means, then push them away. If you use those as your main source, you'll be parroting something that somebody else has thought about. Do not feel you need to understand the language of Shakespeare. You don't need to understand his big ideas at all. Because the, this is not a close study of a text. This is a study of discovery in relation to the text. So you don't have to understand all the language in Shakespeare. And some of the stuff that's a bit tricky, um, I might be making some notes for you about. Keep in mind also that he was a not only a writer, but he was a businessman. He was writing to both entertain and to make money. So at the end of The Tempest, when Prospero talks to the audience and asks them to forgive him by applause, Shakespeare is just letting us, the audience, know that this was a play, a piece of theatre. And don't lose track of that. This is an entertainment. And he made money from his entertainment. Successfully. He made a lot of money, actually. So always remember that Shakespeare was trying to entertain. In fact, The Tempest was classed as a comedy. Yeah, I know. Where are the laughs? Um, I'm going to try and point out a couple of laughs. Shakespeare's audience would have been rolling around on the floor, slapping their thighs and thinking, this is incredibly funny at certain parts of this play. You won't, I didn't, and most modern audiences won't either. That's just a shift. But we'll see some of the slapstick in some of the scenes, some of the comedy, some of the mistakes that Shakespeare's audiences would be looking for and having a huge laugh over. It's like watching old comedies sometimes from the 60s. It was funny then, but it seems really dated now. If you watch, say, for example, Happy Days now, you probably won't remember even know what Happy Days is. I'm showing my age here, but that's all right. Um, Happy Days was set in the 50s, but it was only filmed in about the 80s or 90s, I forget. But it looks dated when you see reruns now. And most people who are in the ages between 16 and 20 think, why was that a huge hit? That's not funny. Yeah, things change. The trick is to engage with the ideas in the play. They are timeless and they bear relevance to your life, my life, and everybody's at life at some time or other. And hopefully, what I'm aiming to do is show that relevance. And two, this is, this is, the, this is the tricky and almost contradictory bit. Try to enjoy writing about discovery and the tempest. 
Okay, you're asking how do you enjoy writing an essay? It sounds like I need to get out more, and you're probably right. What I'm getting at is enjoy expressing yourself. And you're just using The Tempest and other texts that you've found to use as the source for your argument, your ideas and so on. Remember, you're the best English students. So if you are in the advanced class that I'm talking to, and I'm, I'm aiming that way, you are good at English. You are the best English students in the school. Don't fight that fact. Just go with it, accept it and trust yourself. Let's move on now to the text. And discovery. You would have already done a lot of work with your teacher on discovery, all the variations of interpretations, different meanings, etc. But we are going to look at discovery again. But with looking at the Tempest as our Bible or equivalent, your job is to take out of this play elements of discovery that the characters make, that Shakespeare might have intended, and that you have interpreted and given an opinion on. Now, importantly, it's might have thought about. You don't have to know that Shakespeare intends, intended to say this or that. As long as you believe it and you can find evidence that you can also express, that's fine. So before we move into the strange, magical and somewhat fantastical island world of Prospero and his daughter Miranda, let's look briefly at discovery. So let's keep in mind when looking at discovery one simple formula and try and remember this little sort of bits and pieces as we're going through. What starts a discovery? How did the discovery take place? What is the outcome or effect of the discovery? Are all discoveries happy ones or sad ones? Or combinations of both? So each time you're looking at a point about discovery, ask yourself, what starts it? How did it take place? What's the outcome or effect of it? Are all discoveries happy ones or sad ones? And ultimately, what's your point of view about it? Scientists discover some new process or equ equation, but was the discovery based on other earlier discoveries? Are all discoveries always original? When an artist discovers a new way to interpret an image, for example, Picasso, he went from realism to cubism, where he painted a woman that looked like the woman. It was a realistic image of herself. Yet later in his career, he discovered for himself that there was more to the image than just the physical. So he distorted, changed and made the woman look almost unrecognisable. He discovered something in the way he saw things that changed his way of creating. His personal discovery impacted on others. Some laughed at him, some feared what he was doing, some mocked him, others imitated him. Now that same distorted painting of the woman by Picasso was worth millions and millions of dollars today. Now we're going to have, a, I'll show you a couple of those images. This first image is a picture of Picasso doing a realistic portrayal or portrait of a woman. The second image you'll see is Picasso painting the same woman but with a different intention. Not to just show the woman, physical, but to show other aspects for us to discover what he had discovered. Now you saw those and you think, well, what's it there? What's that all about? That's fine. Don't worry about it yet. I'm going to show you two more slides of Picasso's work. The first one you're going to see is of a young girl looking all very childlike, innocent. Then a picture of an older woman. This is Picasso interpreting the young woman as the older woman, but very different images. Is one better than another? Do you prefer one or the other? Doesn't matter. Picasso discovered something which was a truth to him, and that's the important bit. Okay, so you've seen now four images. And by the way, keep in mind that those images, they're texts. So you can use a painting, a photograph, as one of your texts to refer to or support your ideas on discovery. Let's move on. Think of archaeologists who discover an ancient tomb. Why discover? They aren't new. Their discovery uncovers something hidden. The archaeologists also dig up the tombs despite the culture of ancient Egyptians who wanted the site never to be opened or defiled. So think about some of the perhaps moral implications of discovery. Are they being discovered if it's already there? It's not something new, it's something old something that's being uncovered. 
So think of all the connotations of discovery. You're, by the way, going to get fed up um, in the next two, over the next six to eight months where you hear the term and the word discovery four million times. Try and put that to one side and just keep focusing on your understandings and playing around with the idea of it. There's a picture now I'm going to show very quickly of an Egyptian tomb. It's just because I'm stopping you from looking at my face the whole time. You've all seen Egyptian tombs, but it's quite a nice little tomb. Discovery can be interpreted in a number of ways. You need to have your own views and also be ready to broaden and refine your own views of what discovery could mean. And that's really important. Don't limit yourself to a narrow perception because there are so many options. Okay, let me put you on the spot. I want you to write one sentence that starts, discovery can be. So I want you to write that. And then I'm going to ask you to write one more sentence that starts with, yet it can also mean. So two things I want you to do. I want you to write one sentence that says, discovery can be, and finish that. Then would you write a second sentence that says, yet it can also mean, and finish that sentence. So you know you've done that now. This is the next stage of that. And it's actually more important than the first bit. I want you now to read out your sentences and I'd like you all to read them out. Please don't have any sort of, I don't want to read mine out stuff. You're all 17, 18 now. You don't need that stuff. You're all in a, in a group that you know each other. So don't get hung up on this. It's important that you hear your sentences out loud so you can understand, yeah, that makes sense to me. Or, I really like what so-and-so said. That makes even more sense. So I'd like you to, when you get a chance, all take time to read out your two sentences. Then from all the sentences you've heard, write down one that you agree with, as long as it's different to what you've said. So listen to all what's been said, and if you like one that's different to yours, put that down. It's not stealing. Writers do it all the time. They borrow other bits and pieces. It's an idea. So what you've done is write your two sentences down, read them out, now steal someone else's ideas. Okay? Write it down. Don't get hung up about that. Did you like some of the other ones? Did they surprise you? No, it didn't surprise you? That's fine. Don't get hung up. We're just broadening the idea and your understanding of discovery. By the way, I'll repeat again, don't get frustrated by hearing the term discovery all the time. I know classes I've had got fed up with, I think when I was, the last one group I had was doing belonging, and kids got absolutely fed up with talking about and linking every single thing to belonging. Don't worry about it. You don't need to do all that. You will get that feeling, by the way, that discovery-itis, but just don't panic, don't get fed up with it. Just hang on to some understandings that work for you and you have a series of other texts and resources that support these views of yours. We'll talk more about this later, the strange sensation known as area of study fed upness. Okay, now where were, where were we before I get prattling on about discovery? Let's get back to the main text, The Tempest, which was probably Shakespeare's last play. No one's absolutely sure, but they think it's because he died not that long after The Tempest was performed. When someone finishes a career, there's always a looking back, a sense of reflection. Think of yourselves. You're almost finished year 12. Right now, you're too busy to reflect on those years, but you will. You will begin to reflect, and in those reflections, discover some truths about your own life and your own school experience. So think about when you, The Tempest and Shakespeare, perhaps Prospero might be Shakespeare, reflecting on his life, maybe. Sorry, I've la lapsed back into discovery again. So I t told you it's a disease. I'm trying to avoid it. The Tempest starts like a lot of Shakespeare plays with a symbolic storm. Nature, fate, seemingly out to make an impact on the lives of man. I'm going to show you an image here. Now these are a whole series of images from various productions and there's been dozens and dozens of productions of The Tempest. If You, you probably would have seen one now. That's fine. Don't 
try and watch a full production, it'll drive you mad. Look at different images, see bits of the, of the Tempest, and we're going to look at what occurs in the Tempest a bit later on. So don't worry about having to understand all the play, you don't. Okay, you've seen that image of the storm, and you know that it's a, meant to be a huge maelstrom of, of waves and all sorts of bits and pieces. So it's huge. Keep in mind though, at the end of the storm, no one gets drowned, no one dies, and they all come out dry. Yeah, reasonable, likely, unlikely. So why is it unlikely? Perhaps magic is involved, and we know that. So the Tempest, huge, huge storm. Alonso, Gonzalo, Stefano, Ferdinand, Sebastian and Trincolo are returning to Italy after Alonso's daughter Clarabelle was married to the Prince of Tunis in Africa. Yet the storm which came out of nowhere very quickly is so fierce that their lives are all at risk. Watching this massive storm from the island is Prospero and his daughter Miranda. Prospero hints that he has created this storm magically and that he has ensured that no one would lose their lives and that those thrown into the water by the storm will make it to his island safely and dry. Yet in small groups, all unaware of the other group's fates. In fact, the ship, after the storm, is completely repaired magically, and the remainder of the crew are also safe on board and completely dry. This is a concoction. This has been created by Prospero. Sounds like a design. Sounds like he's, he's aiming for a particular purpose in this. Now, do you need to remember all these names? No, not really. Just be aware that Alonso is the boss, Ferdinand is his son, and the others are all officials who have varied political ambitions. So the lightning cracks, wind blows, waves are huge, and all aboard fear for their lives. All are scared except the boatswain. Often Shakespeare has a private laugh at the nobility, even though he was very reliant on noble patronage to keep his theatrical business going. During the violent storm, it is the nobles who panic and prepare to die, but the boatswain, a skilled but ordinary sailor, is calm and unflustered. The men from the ship have all landed on different parts of the island in small groups. Ferdinand lands by himself. We know that Prospero's magical spirit, Ariel, who fidgets and bows constantly, does all Prospero's magical commands and was the one who created the storm. Ariel serves Prospero because Prospero had released him from an evil curse placed on him by Caliban's witch mother, Sycorax, which had imprisoned him in the trunk of a tree before the play has begun. Try and think what Ariel might look like. In all sorts of productions, Ariel is given all sorts of different ways of being shown. He's, Ariel, I've said he, could be a she. Ariel has been shown as a he, a she, large, tall. You'll see later on in the play that his face actually changes into different faces of different people. What's the purpose of Ariel? What's Shakespeare asking us to discover about Ariel? I'm now going to actually now, probably bore you to tears, but I hope not. I'm going to actually explain and tell you about the rest of the play with some slides thrown in so that my face is not the one that you're looking at all the time. But I'm going to get, give you a sense of movement through the play and then some hard exercises after that. So that you understand this is what's occurring, this is the plot, that's where we lead to. Now I know you probably know it already, but just check your understanding from what I've said. And there's no gospel here, this is how I've interpreted and reduced the play. Okay? Prepare yourselves, gird your loins. Now, keep in mind also that this play is in real time. There are no shifts in time. A lot of Shakespeare's plays um, demanded that the audience understood or accepted that it could be the past, the present, two days hence, four weeks, but not with this play, The Tempest. It moves in strict logical time sequence. So Ariel first appears as seen as a slight, weird, dancing, darting, bright thing to look at. Never still, save for trembling dragonfly movements, forever tr trying on different faces as if it are tailors. What does this description suggest about Ariel? This is a, that's a rhetorical question, don't have to answer that. 
but I want you to think about it. There is no one right answer. The rightness is in how you explain your view and how it fits in with the ideas and themes of the play. Ferdinand lands on the island alone. Now that's important. That's a device. We know it's a constructed thing. All texts are constructed. Think back to the Picasso paintings. They're constructed. Miranda, that's Prospero's daughter, has not discovered or known about her father's magical workings. She didn't know. She sensed but doesn't know. Prospero keeps his gifts hidden. Prospero describes Caliban as his poisonous slave. And Caliban is a really interesting character. I'm going to show you a couple of slides of different interpretations of what Caliban could look like. Now the trouble with this is that you in your own mind would already have images of Caliban. And they're probably much more interesting than the ones I'm going to show you. How horrible is Caliban? Caliban is a very contradictory figure and I think once you get come to terms with it, you may find that there's a lot to be discovered about Caliban. Caliban is described as a slow, heavy, lumbering creature, all sounds and bristles, with his ugly nakedness scarcely covered by skins as rough as, and as hairy as his own. A creature of darkness, like the fowl which had borne him, and the devil who fathered him. Do you get that feeling later on? Do you get that feeling as the play moves on and we discover more about Caliban? The fact that Prospero has been torturing Caliban off and on for the last 12 years? How Prospero had learnt everything about the island from Caliban and then steals the island with his magical powers and imprisons Caliban. Yet by the play's end, do we hate Caliban? Do we feel sorry for him? Why? Caliban is one of those contradictory characters. I'm not sure whether I like him or don't like him, but we need to have an opinion about him. This slave, Caliban, wasn't always a slave to Prospero. He was the actual owner of the island after his mother's death. And then Prospero first arrives, soothes and comforts Caliban, teaches him many things. Miranda teaches him how to speak English, or the language that they have. And it's when Prospero gets all the secrets from Caliban that he takes over the power of the island and imprisons Caliban. But this turning against Caliban also coincided with the time Caliban lustfully tried to rape Miranda as she was feed, uh, teaching him the language. So Shakespeare's always balancing things. We start to feel sympathy for a character. Then we find out Hang on, Caliban has this other side to him. But is it because that's his nature? We find out Prospero has other sides to him. But is that because of experiences? So we discover various aspects of different characters as we do in life about other people. Shakespeare likes to move between letting us believe one thing then showing another possible interpretation, a bit like allowing us to discover the inconsistencies of human nature. Now I'm going to actually ask you now to do a little exercise if you wouldn't mind. A bit like the ones we did before. I'd like you to start with the phrase, human nature is, and give us your opinion about human nature. And finish that sentence off. So you're starting with human nature is, finish it off. Then the second sentence straight after, Shakespeare shows us that and finish that sentence. Now I'm assuming, of course, that you've got an, a bit of an understanding of the whole play. If, I'm, if this is too early in your understanding of the play, leave that. But I'd like you to get used to using that sort of sentence structure so you're generalising your thoughts and ideas about this play, some of the issues, and later on we'll use that technique to go back to bring it together as an essay style. So, first bit, start with the phrase, human nature is and finish that sentence. Second sentence, Shakespeare shows us that, and finish that. Ariel tempts Ferdinand to the shore, where Ferdinand starts to mourn for his supposed drowned father. A full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones a coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes. That's Ferdinand. 
in agony and grief about assuming that he was the only one who was saved. They all drowned. Yet we know that his father survived. We know that. Sometimes when we know something in a play that a character doesn't, you know the term for that. That's dramatic irony. So Prospero and, Miranda, Prospero and Miranda, they watch from a height as Ferdinand grieves for his father. Miranda looks in awe at this strange creature. What is it, she says, a spirit? She's only been on the island as a young girl, remember? She escaped with her father, and we'll go into that a bit later, as a young girl. And so the only people she's seen are her father and Caliban. Caliban grotesque and her father an old bloke. So seeing Ferdinand, this young, good-looking man, excites her. And we'll find out that some of that humour I talked about at the start starts to come out in that strange relationship. She's never seen another human being other than, Caliban, uh, other than Prospero. And Prospero cynically and in anger says, No, it eats and sleeps such senses as we have. In other words... Prospero has a cynical view at this stage of human nature. And we know why. Or we begin to know why, what's occurred, and why he has that attitude. Then Ferdinand sees Miranda. They stand and stare in wonder at each other. Shakespeare was, in many ways, despite himself being a bit of a, um, a hard nosed businessman, liked the idea of love at first sight. Think of Romeo and Juliet. Prospero fears Miranda and Ferdinand's feelings are moving too quickly. Like a lot of fathers, they worry about their daughters becoming too infatuated too quickly. Well, I did. Their relationship has not been tested. Despite Miranda's protests, Prospero fixes Ferdinand in irons and says angrily, What did Miranda know of men? Foolish vessel. In other words, you don't know people yet. You don't know what men can do and be the horrible parts that are in men's hearts. Discovery, I wasn't gonna bring it up again, but I have. Are all men that way? Blackness in hearts? Despite all of Prospero's magical powers, he knows he has no power over love. What does this mean in relation to the play? Do we discover that the power of love is all-encompassing. It's a, self, a point of salvation. The scene moves to the second group of shipwrecked people, Alonso, Gonzalo, Antonio and Sebastian. Remember, don't worry about um, knowing all the names. You'll get an understanding that of the different types of groups that um, wash up on the shore. As Ariel's magical, musical sounds causes the those men to sleep, Sebastian and Antonio don't hear the magical music and don't sleep. They look at the sleeping group, then they look at each other, and both have the same idea, kill the king. So the musical charms of Ariel puts some to sleep, but the two people who conspire to murder don't hear the sound. And they decide to kill the king and take over. They drew their swords. Their eyes were glaring. But Gonzalo wakes suddenly. Then they all wake. And Sebastian tries um, to explain that he was just... Oh, I, I thought I heard the sound of a lion roaring and I was protecting everybody. And they believe it. The next scene is one in which Shakespeare uses to inject some comedy and slapstick into the play. Remember, all, his, all of his plays are entertainments. That's the first thing. But the scene also shows some important thematic elements as well. So Caliban is frightened by the strange spirits at Stefano and Tricolo and hides. Tricolo fears this coming storm and hides also under the same cloak as Caliban is hiding. Yeah, I know. Believable? Yeah. But it's a device. It's comedy. Then the king's butler, Stefano, staggers in drunk and he's alarmed at the strange creature under the cloak. Now imagine this cloak and his legs sticking out, both 
Caliban and Trinculo. And he offers this strange beast under the cloak some alcohol. Caliban drinks it, loves it. He drinks some more, loves the taste and the feeling of being drunk. Caliban staggers off with his new companions calling Ban Ban Can Caliban, slightly sloshed, and has a new, has a new master now. Get a new man. In other words, Caliban's master is no longer Prospero, but Stefano because he's got the booze. In other words, the alcohol is now his master. And of course, that's again, he's never had this sense of alcohol or this sense of change, this newness. So what effect does this comedic scene have? And I'm sorry, but try and link it to Discovery. What's the point? How does it fit into Discovery? We switch now from the comedic to the romantic. Ferdinand is fetching wood at Prospero's command and Prospero is making him earn his possible affection with Miranda. And Miranda fears for him. Pray you work not so hard, she says. Miranda's a bit wet. Um, and you think, is she a, a developed character? Not particularly, but she's also very inexperienced, very unformed. As the two declare their love to each other, Prospero is observing and watching. This play has a lot of spying on, which leads to confirmations and confirms some discoveries. Prospero is often watching them through the eyes of Ariel, or he's watching other groups. He is in control. He's like a puppet master, to a point. Ferdinand says, The very instant that I saw you, did my heart fly to your service. Love at first sight. Miranda immediately says, Do you love me? She weeps in happiness and says she loves him. Then she leaves. All the while, Prospero is smiling as this love appears real. How real can love be with love at first sight? Can that be discovered? Back to the drunken trio. Remember that image you saw? With Caliban kissing Stefano's feet and Caliban suggests they recapture the island by killing Prospero. You start to wonder, what is it about these groups? Like in separate groups, their first instincts are, let's go and kill someone. They have their reasons, Prospero to escape, uh, sorry, Caliban to escape from Prospero's control and the others to gain power, political power. Consider how quickly various groups turn to thoughts of murder to get their way. What could Shakespeare be saying about man? Is he reinforcing Prospero's view of man? What can you say about discovery here then? One more exercise. I'd like you to write your thoughts in three sentences, no more than three sentences. You must force yourself to be only three sentences here. Begin with the phrase, human nature. Now you've done something like that before. Now you're developing your view on human nature from what we've seen and what you've seen. So begin with the phrase, human nature. Finish it and write two more sentences. So no more than three. And we'll, we'll talk more. We now move to the other party. The kings with Sebastian still plotting with Antonio to kill the king and claim the throne. Again, music invades the air in grotesque creatures come into being and set a table with glorious banquets and invite the weary travellers to eat. But as soon as they approach the table to eat, a hideous huge bird with the head of a hag and talons like grappling irons scares them and as it flaps its wings, the feast disappears. What is, what isn't, what's real, what's not real. Its red eyes turn on Alonso, Sebastian and Antonio and shrieks, you are three men of sin. So the sense of guilt is reinforced. Shakespeare prepares us for the potential of some characters facing their inner guilt. We move again from the scene of ugly monsters and cries of sin to one where Miranda and Ferdinand are together. This time, Prospero gives his approval and as the two lovers become more physical, he cries out, No tongues! All eyes be silent! Now, Shakespeare's audience would be rolling around in laughter because there's two meanings there. They've got the bawdy, physical meaning, such as 
no tongues. But what Shakespeare is also suggesting, that Prospero is saying, stop talking, stop talking so much, just look at each other. Prospero, like a lot of fathers, starts worrying about it all going too fast. And he wants Miranda and Ferdinand just to back off a little bit. He's happy, but just back off. He means stop talking like lovers and just look. But it also suggests the two lovers are getting very physical. Too physical for Prospero's liking. There's a brief mask, uh, and that's like a, a play within a play. Shakespeare loved that, because he was trying to always to give the impression that things on stage aren't real. It's an illusion. But don't get hung up on the, on the mask. Um, and I probably shouldn't say it, but it's not a big deal. It's just a device. Then the three drunkards. Remember the three before who, where, Prosper, uh, where Caliban has discovered his new joy of alcohol? They stumble in, led by Caliban, in their quest to murder Prospero. When they see beautiful clothes left out, they are entranced and put them on to replace their own rags. But Caliban screams at his friends to not put them on and let's go do the murder first. He's desperate to be free. But as they put the clothes on, Horrible barking begins. Heads appear from the garments and screeching dogs chase them away. If you think about it, it's almost like um, a horror movie, or it could be. But there's so much comedy or nonsense about the way it's constructed that we don't see it. Although, in Shakespeare's time, some of the people in the audience would be shocked by the hideousness of it all. Prospero gloats for a time on his revenge, but Ariel reminds him of his goodness. So all this has been constructed by Prospero. He's watching it. And keep in mind, Shakespeare is constructing it, manipulating it, as Prospero is shaping it and manipulating it. Though he'd acted like a god, had raised the tempest and brought man, men to darkest despair, he himself was still human. Ariel reminds him of his human nature, the goodness in him. And vengeance was for the worst, not the best of his kind. And affects Prospero, Ariel's words. And he says, go release them, Ariel. My charms I'll break, their senses I'll restore. Keep the idea of discovery here in mind. And would you write two sentences here now? Two sentences about discovery and Prospero. Has he discovered something about himself here? Two senses, no more. Now Prospero makes a circle on the ground with his staff and performs his last piece of magic. He dresses in all of his finery of his former position as Duke of Milan. Now remember, he was the Duke of Milan, but he was he gave away the actual operational process, because he wanted to go into the library of his, and study his books. And his brother, Antonio, ruled in his place. And that's what, after a while, Prospero realises he gave away too much responsibility. That was what he was meant to be, the ruler. But he wanted to just do his own stuff in the library. And Antonio takes over. So, then there's Alonso and Sebastian and Antonio. Circle that um, Prospero has made with his staff. They freeze in shock. But as they awake from the trance and gaze at the newly attired Prospero, the king, who had been part of the old plot to kill Prospero years ago, can't bear his guilt anymore and cries out, Pardon me my wrongs. Shakespeare was all about guilt. All about the effect of guilt had on people. In many ways, Shakespeare was talking about things to do with psychology and the impact on the psyche of guilt long before the idea of psychology ever came about. If you're interested, eh, someone might be. Macbeth is a prime example where even Macbeth starts to be acting like a psychologist when he talks about his wife, Lady Macbeth, and why she kills herself. But that's another matter I'm not digressing significantly. Prospero turns to Sebastian and Antonio and they recognise Prospero 
and he, they know that he has seen into their hearts. But he just quickly and quietly says, at this time, I will tell no tales. In other words, I'm not saying anything now. I know what's in your hearts. I know you were attempted to kill. But I'll say no more. He left their crimes to weigh upon their hearts. Was that harsher treatment? The last revelation was Prospero leads the grieving king into his house. That's the king of Milan, remember, who's the father of Ferdinand. He believes Ferdinand has drowned. The king is mourning for his drowned son, or he's thought his drowned son, Ferdinand. Yet Prospero pulls back a curtain, like magician again, to reveal that the two lovers are there playing chess. Why chess? Think about the game of strategy, manoeuvring, um, taking pieces and so on. Then the three drunkards come in, in their fine clothes, all in rags now. And Caliban, upon seeing Prospero in all his finery, says, What a thrice double ass was I to take this drunkard for a god. In other words, he also sees the truth behind his folly with um, the drunk fools that he was with. At the play's end, Prospero stands by the sea. And there's an image here um, of Prospero standing alone, looking out to sea. A tall and lonely figure, silvered by starlight. He one by one casts his possessions into the sea. His magic robe first, then his magic books, and last, his staff, now broken in two. He had no more need of them. By his art, he had made men see themselves. Now he too, like Ariel and Caliban, longed to be free. So that's the play, briefly, very briefly. You may have thought, well, he didn't mention this, or what about, that's fine. If it's important to you, you note it. Now we're going to do a very tricky exercise now. It's a hard one. No apologies. You're bright people. You're strong English students. You can do this. In no more than two or three sentences, I want you to summarise what are the main incidents or incident of each of the five acts. Now, this is hard. So each act has got two or three scenes. Ignore that. I want you to try for each act. So put a little heading, act one, and summarise the main incidents in no more than two or three sentences. Now, that's hard. You've got to select what's important to you, what's important to the themes, and what's important for the sense of um, narrative throughout this play. Do it in pairs if you like. And some, in many ways, I think it might be even better to do it in pairs. It's not a test. The idea is to try to get a feel for the plot movement in the play. When you do this exercise, I'm going to give you my, how I try to summarise it, and I struggle with this exercise. So what? You'll probably do a much better job than I will. So while you're doing this, we're going to pause it, give yourself a chance to do it, and then I'll explain or give you my samples, and you can match them with yours. Okay, that wasn't, that wasn't easy, was it? Did you actually do it? My, sometimes I have a gut feeling that you might have convinced your teacher that it's not the right time to do it, and your teacher being very nice and kind, they said, oh, we'll leave that one for later. Try it. It is important to force yourselves to do this exercise. Okay, I want you to read out your responses, share and debate how accurate each interpretation was. What things that you left out that your partner wanted or that someone else in the class has thought was important. Just discuss it, debate it, what should be left in, what should be left out. Make any changes to your own. Now, I'm going to read out my attempts at doing the same exercise. You can use some of it if you want to. I would think yours would be better. And you'll see how, that, how that's almost certain after I read these out to you. Okay, mine, Act 1. In the first act, we discover who the principal characters are and why Prospero has created the storm. We also see Ferdinand led to his cell, but may not understand Prospero's treatment of him. 
in Act 2. The other shipwreck group perceives the island in conflicting ways, from a type of desert to a place of green, while Alonso mourns the apparent drowning of his son Ferdinand. Caliban gathers firewood, as he was ordered to by Prospero, but encounters the jester Trincolo and Stefano, who initiates Caliban in the delights of getting drunk, after which Caliban refers to Stefano as his lord and master. Act 3. Here Ferdinand and Miranda meet, and after watching Ferdinand carry wood on Prospero's orders, who incidentally is, her, is secretly observing this exchange, the two declare their love, and Miranda asks Ferdinand to marry her. Meanwhile, on another part of the island, Caliban, Stefano and Trincolo plot to kill Prospero and carry off Miranda for Stefano to marry. Magic by Ariel to cause a fight between Stefano and Trincolo, and later a huge banquet is set up which is disturbed by ugly harpies and fierce creatures who carry off the food. I think I did four, maybe four. Is there four questions? There's sentences in there? No, three. So if you can handle Act 3 and do it in three sentences, you're brilliant. Act 4. We are shown the mask which provides both a spectacular interlude and comment on proceedings, which is amplified by Prospero's explanation, and we see the routing of the drunkards. Act 5. This act shows us Prospero wholly in command, with all his enemies at his mercy. Having overcome the tempest in his own mind, he forgives the offenders and is reconciled to Alonso, who rejoices to find his son alive and betrothed to Miranda. So there are the five acts. Compare what I've just said to what you've said. What should I have put in? What did I think and put in that you didn't? We're now going to look at discoveries. I know we weren't going to do too much of that, but it is linked to your um, area of study, discovery. So, let's look at some discoveries. Alonso discovers Ferdinand did not drown. Ferdinand discovers beauty and falls in love with Miranda. He is more experienced with women, but discovers love of, his, of the chaste, virginal beauty he sees in Miranda. It is his idealised, somewhat sexualised version of love. Miranda discovers the beauty of the male form and discovers love, or her very innocent and inexperienced version of love. She also discovers her true identity and her history, I might call him a thing divine, for nothing natural I ever saw so noble, she says. Of course, she hasn't got anybody to compare with, but that's another matter. Prospero discovers forgiveness and also discovers that he was equally to blame for his fate. The audience discovers what? I want you to list here now five things that the audience could discover. Write one sentence about each. So start with... The audience discovers and finish the sentence. Don't use that starting bit again and write another sentence. They also discover. But do it in such a way that it's five sentences containing five different discoveries that the audience makes. The audience is you as well. We've done some exercises, and actually you've done a lot of exercises through this period. I'm working on the basis that you actually have done them. Um, if you haven't, eh, I was going to check really. But it's important that you do do them and that you trust yourself that you can handle these. I've trusted you and I know you're a good English student and we'll come back to that at the end because it's really, really important that you remember that you were able to do this. Okay, next exercise. It's not too, this one's a little straightforward one, but, and it's a short one. What I'd like you to do is, we're talking about discovery, I know. I said I'd try and avoid the, that getting bogged down in the word discovery and so on, but it's what we're doing. It is the area of study, and we're going to be looking at it a bit more. So, for this one, I want you to write very quickly a response to the statements, but I want you to write the opening stem of, that, of this statement first. Now what I mean by that is, I'm going to ask, Prospero discovers that leadership is, you complete it. But what I'd like you to do is to write that stem down first. Prospero discovers that leadership is, write that down and finish it. Do not worry about what someone else is writing about it in the class. This is your voice, your ideas. Okay, so first one, Prospero discovers that leadership is, finish that. Number two, Alonso discovers that friendship is what? 
I mean, we've talked about Alonso. Think about guilt. Think about all those things which could come into it, but you've only got one sentence here. So we try to generalise. Number three, Miranda discovers that love is... Remember Miranda? That naive, love at first sight girl who was discovering the attraction and lure of, of sex and the body for the first time. Number four, Antonio discovers that power is... And finish that off. Now when you finish those, as we did in the early exercise, I want you to read these out to the class. Don't get hung up again. Just read them out to the class and listen to what others have said. If you like something that someone else has done, write it out and use it for yourself. Match it. If they've said, um, Miranda's view of love is X, and you've said it's Y, why is there a difference? Why is theirs sound better than yours? Why do you think yours is better than theirs? Trust yourselves. For example, you might have said, Prospero discovers that leadership is, put your idea here. Now I want you to put a yet after it. This is tricky. So you've got your sentence stemmed down and you've got to you'll finish that off. You've said Prospero's idea of leadership is, and you've finished it. This is the tricky bit. Put a yet after it and finish that. Because remember, Shakespeare is constantly giving us contradictions and balances in here. He's challenging us not to have absolutely black and white answers. But he loves grey. So, Prospero discovers leadership. that leadership is... You've got your idea there. Add now the next sentence, yet. And finish that sentence. It might be a contradictory idea. And would you do that with the next four, where you include Alonso, Miranda, and Antonio's four sentence stems, with a yet after each one. Again, when you finish, share them. Okay. I hope you had a, you were able to battle through that one. It's, it's not easy, but it's important to be, that you move between the saying it's this, but also thinking it could be also this. What you're doing is showing that you have a breadth of understanding of the options and that in life, sometimes there are no black and white answers as much as we'd like them to be. This exercise now, and it's our second last exercise, so um, you can start to breathe easily now. I'm going to read out a, a sort of fairly sophisticated, generalised response to the play and discovery. What I'd like you to do is to take that same style and make it your own. Now, for example, this is the generalised one I'm going to read out. The tempest moves from the discovery of an uncharted island and the creatures that inhabit it to the equally important discovery of the power of love and forgiveness in a world made imperfect by man. That's quite often an essay question on its own. But it generalises some of the aspects of the play. What I want you to do now is to do that same generalisation, but not about the Tempest, but about two other text sources you are going to use. Now this is where we're now trying to incorporate some of the other ones. So I've said the first one, the tempest moves from the discovery of an uncharted island and the creatures that inhabit it to the equally important discovery of the power of love and forgiveness in a world made imperfect by man. So I've generalised. What I want you to do is to write that one out, keep that, you can change it later, use other bits, but keep that one, and generalise now about the two other text sources that you have found. It can be a photo, a poem, a short story, a song, doesn't matter but I want you to do that same style and tone of generalising of that into your other two sources. And this, this is again, I'm asking you to do some pretty hard stuff. If you've been able to manage these exercises throughout, you're doing brilliantly. Well, that was our last exercise. So you can breathe easy, or not, <laughs> however you feel about it. 
And I want to finish now with just four points. Remember, at the very start, I talked about some a little framework that I'd like you to use when you're thinking about discovery and the text you're using. I said, what starts the discovery? How did the discovery take place? What is the outcome or effect of the discovery? And all, are all discoveries happy or sad? Positive or negative? Use that to run your filter over the texts and the ideas you're having. Second point, trust yourselves. You are, your own voice is absolutely valuable. And I know with the kids that I've had in year 12, and even going right back to when I was in year 12, I didn't, I didn't really believe that my voice, things I believed in, were important or would be taken seriously. But that's what people who are marking the HSC are looking for. And who cares about the marking? You are now developing a voice which is you. You are showing your intelligence, your ideas, and what you think about. And believe me, if you do that enough, you'll start to show that in your essay structure. Number three, the more you know your texts, especially the Tempest, the more confident your responses will be. Now, I've been a little flippant at times about the, getting right into the text. Do as much as makes sense to you. The more you know your texts, the more comfortable and confident your responses will be. And finally, trust yourselves. It's the second time I've said this. Your own ideas are valuable. So trust your voice and trust your ideas. And as long as your ideas have got some substance linked to your texts, as long as you know what you're talking about, you know the text references, you'll be fine. Okay, welcome back. I'm actually standing up now, okay? They're, 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 I do have legs. I know it seemed a bit strange to be sitting there all the time, but I just needed to show you that A, this is important, and B, I've got legs. So, looking at this, this is a, called a fishbone diagram, and I find it really helpful as a way of generalizing what goes on in the text and also as a structure for writing an essay and that's the reason we're having a look at it so this is about discovering the tempest obviously and if we put up here text one and we call that that's the tempest that's your main text text one again text two and text three just for argument's sake so that's going to be something you're looking at for text one, which is the Tempest, text two, text three, whatever that you've chosen. Down here, it's about discovery. And that's going to be the same along there, same there, same there. That's going to be discovery. So, text one, what is the event that's going to stand out in your mind? Just put it briefly there. If you need, this is the area on the fishbone to put any quote or quotes that you need. Then, why? What's its relevance to discovery? So, incident, quote, why? Repeat it. Again, the tempest there, 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 there. Same with those, three t those two new texts. And here you put your overarching statement. Overarching just means you're pulling that together to create one statement. And you've done that already today, several times. It might be two sentences, one sentence, or three sentences. No more than three. But this is pulled together. Now, all of this can be two paragraphs. Repeat this two, three, or four times. And that's your structure for a, a, a long and a pretty detailed essay. If you're a visual learner like I am, I need that sort of process. If you're not, if another thing works for you, that's fine. But I find this sort of approach makes things a little more simpler. And that's basically two paragraphs there. Okay? Try it. Trust yourselves. Before we move on, this is the, the 
question I'm going to ask you to try with your teacher and the whole group as though it's an HSC question and use this fishbone diagram to support this. So this is the question and it's one I've made up. It's difficult. It's meant to be the area of study question that I think might be um, a useful question to try. This is the question. Discovery can be as much about losing as about finding. Referring to your set text, The Tempest, and two or three other sources, discuss how valid that statement is. So that's the question, which is the big one you're going to be looking at. Not easy. Start with that. Look at the things you've already done. If you look at those, some of those generalisations you've done, they'll fit in there. Best of luck. If you want any more details, any more ideas that I've mentioned today, just talk to your teacher and they can contact me and I can provide them with any details, any extra bits and pieces, any bits of the um, discussion that we've had today for you to use. So go through your teacher and I'm more than happy for you to have whatever you need for the um, HSC. Best of luck and I think I might have said it, trust yourselves.